Welcome to today's webinar, which is an FD's role in private equity backed investment. My name is Phil Scott, director at FD Recruit. I'm joined today by three expert panelists who will be sharing their knowledge of working within PE backed businesses. The running order for today, we've got a main set of questions which I'll be putting towards the panelists. And then for the audience, if you would like to put any questions um, towards the end of the session, then use your chat box facility, which is located at the bottom of your screen. So I'm going to introduce my panelists one by one. Um, we've got Colin Mills, Matt Tiller, mm -hmm. and Chris Dunley. And we'll go over to Colin, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself. Um, just, just give everyone a quick 60 seconds of who you are and how you first got into private equity. Yeah, uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, no surprise, I started off as a true and qualified ACA with um, one of the big four, PwC. Uh, very quickly left then and moved into large multinational corporate experiences. Um, uh, I guess the key experience there was with the US multinational, um, operated around the world as a, as a global director and indeed running um, the Philips TV supply chain across multi-sites. Multi, multi I guess that set me off on a, on a good footing to get into private equity because it was a, a very broad, um, broad um, um, role that I undertook. Um, left the global role and came back regionally and got involved in a series of private equity deals with high net worth individuals and private equity firms such as Livingbridge. Um, again, across a range of sectors, both in terms of um, consumer electronics, infrastructure, electric vehicles. And then finally got into a steel business um, with Endless LLP, private equity. Joined them as a CFO. Um, after a couple of years, myself and my partner, the CEO, we bought the um, private equity out completely um, through an NBO and gave them a very attractive exit. We ran that business for five years and then we um, successfully executed our own um, sale to a trade buyer um, and got out in July 18. I stayed on and ran the business then as the CEO. So I got from CFO to a CEO role and then laterally as a CEO role. And I left that business in July and I'm currently now advising corporate finance people on pre-acquisition activity and pre-private equity acquisitions. Thank you, Colin. Matt, over to you. If you give everyone a, a quick introduction of who you are and uh, how you got into private equity. Thank you, Phil. Um, Colin has already betrayed the fact he must be younger than me because he came out through PwC and I'm old enough that I came out through PW. Um, I came out through Coopers and Lyra and apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, um, I was part of the Pricewaterhouse business actually in the early 90s. It was my audit group out of which the whole concept of transaction services was formed. And so I got involved in private equity due diligence actually quite an early stage, even as I qualified. I went sort of round the houses quite a lot before I before I got there. Um, I uh, stayed. At, I actually stayed at PW for for eight years, doing a mixture of audit work and due diligence work. Then I did four years as an investment banker, doing M and A for a living. And then I spent twelve years at a company called Inmarsat, a satellite communications company, big global company, which was actually owned, as it happened, by um, Apex and Premier, the private equity funds. When I got there, got involved in the IPO there. Did a whole range of roles there um, until I sort of ran out of roles to do other than the CFO. Um, left there and then ended up as a number two at a private equity back business, David Lloyd Leisure, that many of you may be, uh, may be members of. Um, went in there basically through, through a contact actually at, at old PW Contact, who was a private equity partner there, wanted some help with that. And that was sufficient to get me my first uh, private equity CFO gig um, a couple of years ago, which was a business called the Active Care Group, um, focusing uh, really on the M&A and business transformation side that I'd been doing in a number of my previous roles. So I did that um, until earlier this year, I've mainly been homeschooling and uh, generally keeping the family sane during, or trying to keep us all sane during lockdown, um, but now also doing a bit of pre-acquisition advisory work and uh, seeing what else comes around. Thanks, Matt. And uh, Chris, uh, over to you. Uh, give everyone a quick uh, introduction of who you are and how you got into private equity. 
Uh, hi, uh, Chris Dunley. So my background, similar, um, ACA, I was at KPMG for um, a number of years, both in the UK and overseas. Um, left there, worked for uh, listed corporate uh, cable and wireless um, for a couple of years and then moved as group financial controller into a private equity backed energy business um, and was made CFO um, 18 months later um, and have been in uh, private equity or VC backed businesses ever since mainly energy but not exclusively um, I've done a home rental business and a uh, water treatment business as well. Um, various stages of the cycle, um, some interim, some longer term, um, just working with PE houses uh, around uh, exits and restructurings mainly, uh, developing finance functions. Thanks, Chris. Um, so how we're going to do this today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, pre-private equity, um, so raising private equity. Then we're going to talk about um, life under a private equity uh, um, ownership and then we're going to talk about uh, the sort of end of, you know towards the end of that which uh, is uh, about exits so let's start at the very beginning uh, I'll go over to you Colin um, what is private equity for first and foremost well, private equity firms their 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 reason for existing or is, are they they raise funds um, sourced from large institutions and large high net worth individuals or high net worth individual, um, large wealthy families will invest that money in private equity uh, with the sole reason for those private equity firms to invest in companies, buy companies, um, exit those companies and make a profit and return those funds back to those institutions and families. Um, those funds will probably have a lifetime of about 10 years. So within that 10 year frame, the private equity is responsible for spending that money, investing it, and giving it a very healthy return. And I guess why private equity is so attractive in today's um, world is because where do you put your money if you're if you're a wealthy individual or an institution that needs to invest and invest his money? And private equity offers that route. It's 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 slightly more risky, but it can also um, offer attractive rewards. Private equity is in distinction to venture capital. Private equity will generally want to invest in companies and take a majority stake. And taking that majority stake, they are taking a, bit, a better, more control of the company. Whereas venture capital usually is in early stage companies and generally take more of a minority stake in a venture capital, capital venture. Um, so yeah, that's private equity. Thanks, Colin. And Matt, over to you. What are what would you say the advantages are of, of uh, private equity or over other forms of uh, raising finance? Well, I think private equity, from the point of view, if you're coming at it from the point of view of a business owner, which it, I think is probably the place to start, then it it gives you a unique ability to to partially realise your, your investment, the value you've built up in that, but still to retain skin in the game for the next stage. You'll get hold of more more funding than you ever would be able to from a bank almost almost certainly um obviously you could completely exit and sell the business but by by bringing a private equity firm on board you have you have a, the ability to partially realize your investment but also to, to keep skin in the game and carry on growing it and i think if you pick the right private equity partner then they can give you an enormous amount of help in in growing that in growing that business too for example i worked at david lloyd um which is an investment of a, a private equity firm called TBR Capital, who specialise in consumer businesses. And they actually stole the whole data, data science team from PwC because they like them so much and have this unique data science capability, which if you're a membership business with, like David Lloyd, with 600,000 members, all providing you loads of data every day, you can add enormous amounts of value to a way, uh, in a way that uh, the business alone would not be able to ever ever afford. And likewise, maybe smaller private equity firms will have specialist operating partners who will uh, experience business people who will, who will spend their time creating value, helping the portfolio businesses. Um, again, in a way that a business on its own would not be able to afford. 
So if you pick the right private equity partner for your business, then they can genuinely, uh, genuinely help it, genuinely help increase value. Thanks, Matt. And um, Chris, over to you. What are the um, scenarios that you see where uh, private equity is preferable um, over other ways of uh, funding? Um, I think we, I think, I think Matt touched uh, touched on them um, largely. It's, I mean. Because it's equity funding, not debt, uh, there's a lot more scope for uh, to increase the size of the investment relative to the business. So you can invest perhaps at an earlier stage with a view to growing the business, uh, either organically or by acquisition. Um, and it's a different risk appetite to debt funding. Um, debt funding, you know, banks typically want to have a much, much firmer, set of security that they can um, take uh, before they lend you money and, and they want to understand what the cash flows are of the business and they, they will be more skeptical about racy projections. Private equity uh, you know, will take a different view, they'll have a different risk appetite but the consequence of course is that you as an owner will give up some of your ownership uh, and almost certainly uh, as Colin says you will give up control um, private equity i haven't really come across any private equity investor that has not made sure that they've got control over the business that they've invested in thanks um, and it's, it, it also fills a gap a bit between um early stage funding uh, which could be friends and family could be angels uh, could be vc and and um funding later on where a business has uh, really established <coughs> established cash flows uh, if it doesn't if it needs to grow from that small scale start to a to a bigger business um, that funding uh, PE can be often the only route route forward uh, just put to me um, fairly early on in my PE career from an owner's point of view better to have a small part of a much bigger piece than a small stake or sorry a big stake in a small business and and that's um that's a view that a lot of a lot of owners will agree with thanks chris and um colin o over to you what um for someone who was maybe going to introduce uh, pe finance into their business what is it that makes a business attractive to <laughs> the pe house just before answering that, just to touch on the, um, the, the, the preference for PE funding, the, the, the one thing that, you know, PE gets a lot of critics, but it is proven success to, to drive returns. And the whole um, relationship with PE with their investors is reflected in how they run the business. And that incentivized um, approach does drive profit. And sometimes family owned businesses can reach a point where they're tired, um, they've lost direction. And PE does certainly inject a, 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 a big incentive and a big level of tension to drive profit. So it's a proven model. In terms of businesses that are attractive to those PE houses, they're clearly looking for a differentiator. They're looking for a product or a service or an offering that's going to create a difference in the marketplace. Um, a robust operation. Um, PE houses are generally very wary of companies that may have liabilities or claims or warranties hanging over them or freehold property that might be um, have an environmental issue so they certainly are very careful at looking at potential liabilities through the due diligence process which we'll talk to um, later on in this webinar um, growth prospects are essential um, they're looking for a business they've taken on a majority stake and their sole reason is to exit that business. So they want to create value. So they want to have a business that they can invest in and look to grow. Um, but wrapping all that up, what is key is the management team. And that management team is invariably headed up by obviously the CEO and the CFO, which is where we come into the FD. And that pairing is essential to drive confidence in the PE house. So when the PIs comes to invest, and also when they come to exit, it's the CFO and verbally will play an integral role in providing confidence and trust in the business and the numbers they're producing. 
And I'm sure we'll talk about that going forward, but I, I think that's a key element. Thanks, Colin. Matt, over to you. What documentation needs to be prepared before raising PE finance and, and who's responsible for this? Thank you. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's best practice, certainly. I think it's fair to say, particularly in the current market, then private equity firms are hovering over distressed assets of some, time, of some kind. Um, and there may not be time, there may not be the resources to, to follow best practice. So I think in, in any circumstances, PE firms, particularly if there's an opportunity there, will, will get on with what they're given. I was talking to somebody yesterday who's got minimal information and is having to, to take a punt on something and then only getting due diligence uh, once they get exclusivity, uh, only really getting in under the nuts and bolts once they've, once they've made a, an offer based on very, very limited information. So there is, so situation doesn't always allow for best practice, particularly in the current market. But the best practice probably would would still be the traditional information memorandum or IM, which is unashamedly a selling document. It's like like the brochure that a stage agent puts together for your house, probably with a bit more bit more detail in it, uh, co covering everything that we talked about there, everything Colin talked about. So covering the market position, the competitive position, obviously the financials, the customer base, the operations, the assets. And also, also talking about any risks that any buyer needs to be aware of because they're going to come up later in the process anyway. So that would the information memorandum I think would traditionally form the basis for a for a first round offer to to assess um, the real level of interest from a wide range of potentially interested parties, and then you'd get into more the due diligence process, further information, meet the management team um, before a, a second round. Uh, probably of, of offers were made, um, but that, that information memorandum would be the starting point, followed up either by by a buy side due diligence process or whether the, the company putting together a vendor due diligence, getting its own um, accountants, lawyers, tax advisors to prepare due diligence information on the basis that that minimises uh, effort for the, the company only doing it once rather than a number of times for different buyers. Um, that um, so that, that would, I think, be the traditional approach where time and the process allow for it. In terms of who puts that together, I think inevitably um, you would get some kind of advisor on, on board. That could be, depending on the size of the business, that could be a, an investment bank, it could be a specialist firm, it could be one of the accounting firms, um, or big or, big or small. Um, I think you would, you would always want to get an advisor uh, involved in that process. They, they know the, the buyer population, they know the buttons to, to press as much as the four of us here might think that we know the buttons to press. You've got advisors who do that for a living. Um, and I think outsourcing that obviously for a fee is the way most people would go, unless anybody disagrees. Thanks, Matt. Um, Chris, who's responsible for approaching PE houses then? Well, I think, I think that picks up on um, Matt's point is that that in reality most uh, most of these things will mo most management teams and owners will take a view that they want uh, some sort of intermediary to run the process, make sure they've got as wide a um, selection of potential buyers because after all this is largely an exit um, in, in shape or form. Um, as possible uh, and and that there's some rigor around a process because it's it's quite easy to see that if you don't set it up right at the start um, what what's going to happen is that the process will either fall apart and fail down the track because you haven't got the right information you're not presenting the, the business in the right way or um, or, or you don't get what you want out of it and I think that's a key thing is well from a from the existing owner's point of view, who need to be very clear what it is that uh, they are trying to get out of this private equity investment. Is it is it to be to find a partner to come in alongside them, or is it really an e a full exit? And although they may stay on to help run the business afterwards, um, they they are taking their value 
uh, and uh, relinquishing their ownership. Um, so I think you know, the owners need to be clear what they're trying to get out of the process. Um, and then they need to put together with the management team a plan of action. Um, and that may well be an intermediary, um, most likely to be an intermediary who will then have a view on, on process and will be able to critically assess what the business offers and the best way to present and pitch that business. And all the things uh, that Colin talked about around um, markets, product proposition uh, and, uh, and team. So that, that's kind of the process. And then it, it would likely be the intermediaries who would work out who the right P houses are to go and talk to. There's no point in talking to all P houses because um, they specialize, they specialize in sector um, and the types of business they're interested in. Um, now, it may be that the, that the existing management team have contacts and, and no reason not to use those, but um, it, it's about finding the right P houses uh, in the right, right sectors and who have the right, right philosophy to work alongside the management team. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely right. P houses want to be supportive and can bring a huge amount of value to a management team to grow a business. And um, choosing the P house is an important part of that. Thanks, Chris. And Colin, uh, over to you. I, the actual presentation to uh, P houses, what's involved in that? Yeah, um, again, just on, on the prior question, private equity is all about investing in opportunities. Um, Quite often, private equity will go looking for companies rather than companies having to go on a beauty parade. So you, you will find that some companies haven't been looking for an active sale, but will be actively approached by private equity. So that leads on to the, the main presentation document, which is the sales prospectus. You, you need to be ready for that. And the IM invariably involves probably a, a 30, 35 page PowerPoint slide where you're trying to summarize everything to maximize that multiple that you're trying to get the um, investor to invest in your company. So you really are trying to sell the company. You're kicking off with probably a one page on investment highlights, you know, 10 bullet points of what makes you special, what makes you different, what is the value, whether it be the quality of your margins, whether it be the market um, uh, penetration you've got, or whether indeed it be um, some of the um, growth pro propositions you've got in place. So it's a, it's a one page summary highlight, um, followed by probably why do you need the funding? What are you gonna do with the money? Is it a complete exit or is it a, 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 a buy and build strategy that you're looking to do? Um, as I said before, um, you'll wanna provide an overview of the business in a very concise manner in terms of what is the operation process, what's your key sourcing, um, who are your key customers, um, and also looking at the, the, the organization structure and the key critical management people. So you're probably looking at yourself, the, the, the CEO and your first line um, management in place. Um, you're looking at the customers and the key markets that are served, trying to summarize what are those channels that you've got and what um, knowledge you've got of those markets and how much you're dominating those markets or, or controlling them. I think key is, is, is wrapping that up, is, is that you've, you've described the business, you've described the customers, but give me five or six value creation points. Tell me what you're gonna to do to grow this business. It starts to get me excited about the fact that today the EBITDA is X, but tomorrow it's gonna to be Y, Z, it's gonna grow. Because I've got these five or six key points that I'm gonna grow for, and I want your help to deliver that. Um, understand your key competition, understand those threats to the, those markets. And then where the CFO then kind of wraps up, wraps it all up is a financial summary. You know, you're looking at obviously historic results, but you're going to want at least a three year forecast there, P&L, the balance sheet, the cash flow. And that's is where valuations can be destroyed or created because your, your numbers need to be challenging, um, but they need to be deliverable. And when the due diligence kicks in, they need to have confidence in those numbers. So, you know, if you can deliver forecasts that as you go through the due diligence process, the actual reality is they can, they can grow, then that creates um, a benefit on the multiple. If they start to get tested and they're weak, 
you can destroy a valuation very quickly. Uh, and that's one of the key messages that I have for the participants on this call is that you need to have confidence in the numbers and the CFO stroke FD is critical to that. Thanks, uh, Colin. Um, also, let me just ask you a quick, quick question then. How do you sort of get the, how do you decide on the value? In terms of valuation, there, there, there are many ways, but you know, one of the more traditional ones is looking at a, a multiple on EBITDA. And then the question is, what is that EBITDA number? Is it the current year's number? Is it the forecast? Is it the historic? Um, certainly in my own experience, it was looking past the last four years of an average EBITDA that was a deliverable. Um, so that would give you a base EBITDA to, to apply to a multiple. And then based on those value creation um, opportunities, you have a justification to say that my EBITDA is X, but I want to add on A and B to that because I think that's a deliverable that you will enjoy in, in the acquisition. Uh, and then the multiple is very much sector based in terms of is it an exciting dynamic sector where the multiples could be 10, 12, even 20, or is it a more traditional sector that's a bit more of a, the growth is going to be a bit more um, um, I'm slower and it could be a multiple of five or six or whatever. So certainly applying that. Um, alternatively, if the profits potentially are not reflective of the true valuation, um, it could be an asset-based valuation as well. Or it could be a combination of both. Thanks, Colin. And, and Chris, uh, over to you. How can deals be structured and, and what's the FD's role in this? I think, I mean, it, it's, it's, again, it depends what, what the owner's out, um, desired outcome is, uh, whether it's a, a straight sale of the whole business or, a, or some sort of um, uh, equity injection alongside, um, which will then uh, grow the business forward. So I think it, it, it depends what the ultimate objective is. Um, I've seen... I've seen both. Um, I mean, we haven't really talked about, but but a, a lot of PE deals are are carve out from larger corporates where a corporate wants a wholesale exit from a particular segment of their business and will look to uh, other buyers to to take that part of the business on. So that's a wholesale uh, exit strategy, um, and the PE house will take a uh, hundred percent ownership. And, and then there will be an incentivization piece typically for, for the management team. But uh, where, it's, where it's an owner, existing owner who wants finance in alongside, um, then typically have different share classes, uh, different ownership rights. Um, it's really what can be negotiated between the parties from, from the private equity house they they are interested in control um they as i said before it, it, it's just vanishingly rare that they would not want to control the ultimate um end of the business in an exit so that will always that will always be up for grabs but the economics is is a matter for negotiation uh, and normally at this point, it's the is when the, um, the sort of management team incentives are are set. Um, certainly, as regards the equity or option type arrangements that that are put in place. <clears throat> Thanks, um, Colin. Quick question to you: What are the factors that uh, you, you'd consider when choosing a particular PE house? I think. Um, Number one for me would be trust, um, and that works both ways. I think you're going to have to, and it is more like a, probably possibly like an interview process when you meet the individuals. Um, but do you trust them? You know, have you got knowledge of the background of the deals they've done before? Do you get a warm feeling that they're going to help you grow this business and grow your relationship with your customers? And equally so, they're going to have to have trust in the management as well. So. I think trust is a concurrent theme in the whole P relationship between management and the PE firm. Um, are they going to take an active or a passive involvement? Um, I think most likely they're going to take an active involvement. They're going to want to control the business in terms of the strategy, not control the day to day. That's for you to run with your CEO. Um, but they will want to get involved. And so again, 
if you're taking an active involvement, do they have experience of your sector? Um, have, they, have, they, have they shown that, that they can actually bring their own connections and their own um, contacts to actually help with the business as opposed to just being potentially a burden, burden on you? So I think trust and the level of active involvement that you can leverage from them are, are, are key in that relationship. Thanks, Colin. And, and Matt, to you quickly, just give us a quick overview of the due diligence process um, with, with the PE House. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Apologies for my brief disappearance there. Hopefully I'm uh, back on and you can hear me. Um, the due diligence process, you will be asked every question that, any, that anybody could ever wish to, uh, to think of and ask, really. Covering, obviously covering the financials to make sure that the, the financials provided really reflect a true and fair view economically, not just in accounting terms of what the business is doing, whether there's any one-off items or anything that, have, that distort the results, but also not just financials, tax, um, legal issues, customers potentially, market, uh, competition, commercial due diligence, um, both in terms of proving the value of what the investor thinks they're buying, but also, as was pointed out earlier, identifying any risks that could impact the valuation for those investors later on. So if it's important um, or could, e could even possibly be considered important or material, you'll get asked about it. It's a simple summary, I think. Thanks, Matt. Um, and just uh, there's a few questions uh, coming through and I, um, I know Zoom provides uh, an email address for questions to, to, to be emailed. Um, we haven't got that inbox open. So just as a reminder, any questions that we'll cover uh, with the panelists at the end, if you just pop them into the chat box at the bottom, uh, of your screen, uh, that's the folder we'll be going through towards the end. So um, let's move move the discussion on to the sort of um, life with the PE uh, on board. So po post deal. So over to you, Chris. What happens once the PE house is on board? Well, I think I mean, again, it, it depends a little bit what the deal deal was like. Um, not uh, many. P houses will have a view of the management team and a business when they're looking to buy, and and uh, you know bluntly they may want to change parts of the management team, and they won't be hanging around um, if they need if they decide they need to make those changes. Uh, it's not uncommon, to be honest, that the they want their own finance person in place, um, and uh, it's it is often often the case that they will put a C a CFO. In a business that they bought, um, because that's that gives them, if you like, a, an avenue into the into the business. But even if that doesn't happen, it's very important for the CFO to build a good relationship uh, and a good open relationship with the PE house. They'll be looking for information. They are PE houses are without exception data hungry, uh, and they will want. Um, a lot of information and so it will be essential that the business can can provide that um, uh, as quickly as possible and as accurately as possible and they need to have the systems in place and we'll talk a bit about some of that uh, i guess a bit later on um, they'll also have a strategy uh, or will want to draw up a strategy to make sure that the business plan they've bought into is deliverable and that might be a hundred day plan and all, all that sort of usual stuff um, but they will want to spend a lot of time with the management team to make sure that everyone's clear um, what needs to happen to meet their expectations and make sure things are on track. Um, and I guess the other point is typically, as, I, as I've said, control will have, will have changed um, as part of the transaction. And um, there will be changes to approval processes, um, perhaps not day to day, small stuff, but any big decisions almost certainly will need to be blessed by the PE house. Uh, and um, you need to put in place um, routes to doing that, which cause minimum disruption to the business. Clearly it doesn't wait to uh, work to wait a month or so before you can get a spend decision or a, or a capital item uh, approval to be purchased so you need to have a open discussion to get those things moved through thanks chris and and, and uh, similar to, to you colin what's the working relationship like with the p house and um you know once they're on board and how is the fp involved in this 
I think that fundamentally um, depends on how trading is going. Uh, I think the, um, the relationship with some of the PE and CFOs in January, February of this year compared to April and May were, were night and day. So clearly when trading performance is going well, um, you know, the, the flow of questions coming through or the, the modeling that's required is less so. But ultimately, whether trading is good or bad, you know, one of the key messages I would give to any uh, prospective um, FD is that the relationship is one where you've got to be ultra responsive. Um, some of the values that I live by um, are speed of response and sense of urgency at all times. And that's what PE um, houses expect. Because uh, you've got to remember the core reasons why they are there is they've taken funds, they invest to feed money back to their institutional uh, investors. So they're looking for something very, very quick turnaround. Um, they're looking for trust and integrity. Um, it is paramount within the, the, that CFO relationship. Uh, and also at board meetings, you know, the, the board meeting is your PR event where you come on stream, you might meet your uh, investor once a month. So you've got to keep calm, don't panic. Uh, you will probably be asked questions on the spot that you know you probably don't have the answer to. But at all times, my best advice is, you know, provide a sense of gravitas and, and calm in those meetings because, you know, it comes back to this trust bit, you know, you're the cornerstone of the numbers. And if you're wobbling, um, they feel the valuation of their assets wobbling also. Um, manage expectations. I think that is one of the key um, assets or a key value that a good CFO can bring. Um, under promise over deliver. Um, make sure that you've got a good handle on your accounting provisions. Um, and if you've got bad news to, to, to give, make sure that you possibly prepared them for that bad news prior to the, uh, the board meeting. Um, and also don't deliver a black and white message, which is we're doomed and there's five million pounds that are written off and there's, there's the results. You know, you've, you've got to provide some kind of color to the, the message, even if it's a bad one, where you've thought around it and you've thought around alternatives to possibly mitigate what could be a, a, a bad message. And then finally, in, in that relationship with the PA, don't get fixated with you and the investment director. Ultimately, you've got to keep a real close relationship with your CEO. You've got to listen to him or her, and you've got to make sure that they're involved in all communication with the PA. Right, so the last thing you want to do is not to be aligned with your CEO when communicating with the PA. House. I think that, that is ultra critical. Thanks, Colin. And um, Matt, question to you then. So um, what changes when it moves into private equity ownership? What's the sort of difference from being private ownership to, to, to moving across to, to private equity ownership? Well, I think Chris and Colin, they've probably covered a vast array of, of, of things there and at least as much detail as I could. But I think, I mean, the whole, the, the whole dynamic has changed relative to private ownership um, because you've ceded control. So in, in terms of uh, needing to respond to whatever questions you're asked, uh, between messages, approval processes, data requirements, <laughs> Um, that is all likely to be driven um, by the private equity firm who have a, will have a tried and tested method of, of doing things, a tightly tested set of information they want. And even if they're not, um, not right in, in your view in what they're asking for, by definition they're right because they're the boss, they're the owners, they're in control. Um, so the, mind, the mindset really becomes, um, I mean, Colin's point about being in line with your CEO is a massively important one, but fundamentally, you, you do exist to serve the requirements of the, of the private equity house and you need to see your, your, your world in that way, really, I think. Thanks, Matt. Um, and Chris, other than the PE house, what other stakeholder management would the FD be involved in? Um, well, I guess all of the usual ones that they would be in any business. So, um, you know, suppliers, customers, um, uh, compliance, um, Private equity will often tr look to inject debt into a business, um, uh, possibly alongside their own funds, uh, particularly for acquisitions. Um, so you may have a whole set of lender relationships, but you may have had those anyway, um, in which case those are also critically important to make sure covenants and the like are, 
are under control and again you need to create or, or create a good channel of communication with uh, with the lenders um, it's not uncommon as well for p houses to put in what are if you like independent independent chairman uh, who act as a sort of industry expert um, and sit between the management team and the PE house, uh, particularly if they are not um, detailed sector specialists. Um, and they are can often be a useful conduit for management to have um, discussions um, kind of uh, bef before broaching topics with the PE house uh, using the chairman as, a, as an honest broker. So that's another relationship. If you have one of those, it's another relationship that um, is, is important to make sure they're up to speed with what's going on. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Colin, what should the FD and, and not just the FD, the finance team expect from having uh, PE backers? I think, you know, before we even get to an exit stage, you know, the, the information requests will be fast and furious. So I think if you're coming into a PE back business and, uh, and you're the CFO or FD, one of my key recommendations is have a really good look at your finance team because you know if your finance team is weak, that's going to get exposed very quickly during an exit process um, because um, you're the kind of the key conduit for the information that's going to um, be requested in a, in a DD process. So it's important that you invest in your finance team. It's important that you um, mentor them, um, keep them informed, um, and keep them updated. Um, try not to micromanage them too much, but make sure that you've got a really strong finance team underneath you because that's going to pay dividends um, very, 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 very quickly. Um, you've got the board meetings that will be coming through on a regular basis as well, but. You, one of the things that I'd also recommend to any prospective CFO of a PE business is with your finance team is get your modeling right. Um, it, we'll all have our own models on producing a management set of accounts or whatever, but the modeling that you provide for your management accounts that leads into your budget pack need to be iterative so that when it comes around to PE requests during their ownership and certainly coming up to an exit, you need to have a model that's tried and tested that, that can turn whichever way but lose in terms of providing different scenarios. And that was one of the key things that I did very early stage is to get a model that was my toolkit and provided me all the answers from a DDE process so that when you're going through that, it's, you know, that's the question, there's the answer, give me the next question. So I think with your finance team, early doors, day one, start looking at your modeling and making sure that it's robust, iterative, and can be um, subject to um, quite a lot of scenario testing. Thanks, Colin. And Matt, are there any other um, sort of considerations to think about, like covenants? Yeah, covenants almost certainly you would have to think about. And um, these, these could come in a number of ways. As uh, the other guys have said, most private equity firms will put debt into a business, sometimes quite a lot of debt, depending on the view of the banks and the, the sector and so on as to how much debt that can support. And that will almost certainly come with covenants of some, time, of some kind. Um, probably quarterly compliance will be the, the standard one. Your, your EBITDA to debt ratio has to be within a certain range um, uh, at, at the end of each quarter. Otherwise, the private equity firm has to do something about it, which would make you very unpopular as a CFO. Um, but also um, there probably be certain requirements, uh, more tighter ones probably, not just the basic supply ones, if you want to do acquisitions and particularly if you want to distribute any money to the shareholders, the banks would require a, a higher level of comfort to, to uh, allow that to happen. So managing the covenant position and sometimes you have some uh, restricted payments or baskets of, of funds for distributions and so on that also need managing. But either way, those, those banking financing requirements are, are in a leveraged situation, which is most private equity situations highly likely to be a material inhibitor of, of, of freedom to act in the way you otherwise might, might want to as a business. Um, I think those, those would be the main ones beyond um, the sort of standard 
regulatory requirements and obviously the private equity firms will have their own um, internal uh, ways they want to, to do things that you have to watch out for. And also there are various corporate governance requirements around the private equity world, um, which most private equity firms will want to stick to as well, which will require you to do certain things in a certain way and to report certain things around governance. So you'll see by moving from the, private, the public company world to the private company world, you certainly haven't got rid of those increasingly onerous corporate government requirements uh, completely. But um, they're certainly less than they would be in the public company world these days. Thanks, Matt. And Chris, um, very briefly, how, how long would one expect to have a PE house on board for? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit held on a piece of string. I mean, the, the reality is the average fund life is around about 10 years. That's what investors commit to lock their, their money up for, typically, that sort of number. Um, and so the PE houses are going to then invest those funds um, over the following few years and realise then after typically a lifespan of um, what well, used to be three to five years, I suspect it's gone out a little bit now, it's probably closer to five to seven. But I guess the other message to take away is that potentially you are always up for sale. Um, if, if the right offer comes along uh, after year two, um, then it's more than likely the PE house will, will have a serious look at it and may well elect to exit at that point. So um, you should uh, assume a war footing pretty much from day one, I would have thought. Um, but yeah, typically um, five years is a, it seems to me about an average. I think it's lengthening slightly, but you know, that's where I put it. Thanks, Chris. And um, Colin, over to you, what sort of happens as the P house nears um, the end and, and how do they get an exit? Well, I kind of touching on what Chris said, you know, the end of their time could be next week. Uh, I think that's kind of, again, the message is that you've always got to be ready for an exit uh, from day one and start planning that. Because come the exit, you know, what's going to be requested, the information that's going to be requested from both their, their legal teams, the, the due diligence process, your corporate finance advisor on the IAM, the fight of all that information invariably is sent it onto the CFO because quite often also in a sale process, the employees may not know what's going on. It could be uh, something that's subject to um, um, uh, an NDA and one not to be disclosed. So all information um, invariably flows through to the CFO. So um, they're going to have to be starting to get ready for, for that. The other thing as you approach an exit, and we touched on it earlier about stakeholders, you know, my recommendation is one of the key stakeholders in that process is your legal advisor. Um, the legal advisor and the, and the bill is, is paid for by the company, um, not the PE house. And it's important that you as the CFO stroke CEO are actively involved in who you select as your legal advisor because they're gonna be integral in terms of the documentation that's going to come your way with all you know the, the skill and experience you may have you're going to need to have a really good legal advisor to take you through the documentation that, that you're about to embark on so it'll be one of my key recommendations in terms of stakeholder engagements is that the cfo needs to ensure that he's got a really good commercial legal advisor that's going to hold, hold his or her hand throughout the process and, and, and Colin, uh, while I've got you, how should the FD and the management team be incentivised to, to achieve their goals? I think that needs to be identified almost day one in terms of the process, process of, of, of a sale process. It's critical. It's critical to the success of, of an exit that not only the CFO, but the senior management team going across that deal are properly incentivised. Um, the management team are both on the buy side and the sell side. And if they're not properly incentivized, you're going to destroy value. So, you know, whether it be through, it's unlikely to be equity at that stage, it's going to be through an exit bonus, but they need to be involved and excited about the journey that is about to go on, about the work that they're going to get involved, um, because they're going to be a key deliverer of those value creation initiatives that you're laying out on the other side. Um, and if they're not um, 
part of the team and they're not buying into that message, then your exit process could potentially, um, you could destroy value very quickly. So I think the incentives for the management team need to be thought through, communicated, and get them on board very, very quickly. I think that's a critical part of the exit process. Thanks, Colin. Uh, and just two more questions before we go to the, uh, the audience's uh, questions. As a reminder, anyone that does want to submit a question to the, uh, to the panel, um, just use the chat box facility at the bottom. Um, so, Matt, um, what co question to you. What, what advice would you have for an FD looking to get into a private equity-backed business? Um, I think uh, the sort of two generic generic ways in, one of which is to be an FD of something, develop real sector expertise that makes you attractive to, to private equity firms in that in that sector, or you you come through an, as I was able to do as a number two um, in a private equity business, understand the way of private equity before taking on that that um, CFO role or for FD role yourself. I think in terms of the functional uh, skill sets of a CFO, the, the broad range of things that a CFO has asked for, the one that is going to be most critical in any conversation with a private equity house is the business partnering bit. As Colin said earlier, um, the CFO and the CEO need to be absolutely hand in glove in the way, the way they do things together. And that business partnering element is something that any PE firm will absolutely focus on the experience of an FD um, in uh, before putting somebody into that role. So if there's one functional area you think you're a bit weak on and you want to go in this direction, find find a way of getting getting business partnering experience would be the, the thing I would focus on. Thanks, Matt. And Chris, final question to you. What advice would you have for a business owner who's looking at taking on PE finance? Well, I think we've covered a lot of this before, but I think you need to be really, really clear as a business owner what, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, through taking on this finance is, is it a full exit or is it do you want someone in alongside you um, and then if it's the latter then then you're it's about choosing the right PE house that can add value to to your journey to your business uh, as I say um, better to be a, a small part of a big a bigger business than uh, than the other way around so I, that that I think is you know it's it, it's an exciting opportunity to take your business to probably to a level that you couldn't otherwise have got to, um, but remember that you'll be giving up control, um, and and you'll own a much smaller piece of the the overall pie, but um, it, it is the way to to grow your business probably beyond anything that you could do um, using your own resources or the resources of the business. Thanks, Chris. Um, going I think, Phil, just finally on that one last point, um, the advice also is don't go too early. You be ready when you are going to go for an exit process because very quickly you could get um, bidders coming in who want exclusivity, who, who want to go with an offer that maybe be 10% above another offer, but they want to go now. And if you're not ready for that process, um, you could find you, you'll lose value very, very quickly. So don't go too early and be ready. Thanks, Colin. I'm just going to open up the uh, the questions from the audience. So uh, if the panel uh, have got um, an answer they want to just uh, throw in, just uh, put your hand up. Um, first one is, how do you deal with um, a, a PE firm and their staff members who may have limited company side experience? So how, 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 do you, how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that? Who wants that one? Go on, Matt. I think I mean, the point... <laughs> The, the, the point I said earlier is, 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 is the, the important point here, I think. Even when they're wrong, they're right. And uh, you have to treat them like that. And I think in a, in a decent PE firm, they, they, will know, they will know where their fields of expertise are and they will, they will not try and second guess operational decisions, except if they're an operating partner whose job it is to second guess operating decisions. Um, <clears throat> But you, they, the private equity firms are generally very close teams within themselves. They, the way they operate as organisations, they, they strongly incentivise for collaborative working and, and team outcomes. So you, you, just, you just really need to uh, accept that when you're talking to one person from the private equity firm, you're talking to all of them and need to treat them with a level of respect and understanding that that, that requires. 
Thank, thanks, Matt. Um, another question to the panel. Uh, would you consider moving back into a non-PE environment um, or once you've had PE experience, do you tend to want to remain in that space? Who, who wants that one? I'll take that. Well, I'll tell him. I think having been in the PE world and also being a business owner where I was the shareholder as well, it is, it is the essence of it is, is ownership, accountability and making those decisions very, very quickly. And, and although that can be an intense pressurized environment, it, it, it's great to be the person who's making those decisions and turn them around very quickly. Um, I think in, in a more corporate environment, you've got to respect the levels that come with that. And, and invariably, you don't have that high, high level of empowerment and, and ability to, to work in a fast moving dynamic environment. So in a lot of respects, they are, they are different environments and, and might be a challenge to move back in, into that environment. Having been having enjoyed what is an intense um, uh, environment, but, but hopefully ultimately a re rewarding one. Thanks, Colin. Uh, another question: Should business owners be cautious regarding highly leveraged deals? Uh, don't most PE houses structure deals with high levels of debt? Who wants that one, Chris? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the the. Yes, don't get me wrong, there is still a lot of debt put into into businesses. Um, but of course, it doesn't suit anyone's interests for that level of debt to be too high to be sustainable um, and repayable out of cash flows. Uh, so no one goes into um, a, a lending decision you, you know, wanting to fail because that, that just isn't helpful. Um, it comes down to the quality of forecasts and of course um, the kind of black swans like COVID that cause have caused all the problems that we've seen. But um, I mean the deals I've been involved in, um, mainly infrastructure where a lot of leverage is used, um, those are uh, treated on their merits and, and the banks will take a view of what they can lend and what they can't lend. And um, the, P houses will try and push the envelope, but at the end of the day, um, they can only push it so far. I, I think the other key stakeholder in that debate, and we haven't touched on it, is, is credit insurance. And credit insurers usually have a, a fairly bleak view once private equity are involved. So business owners need to be aware that their credit rating pre deal could be a nine or a 10 and could very quickly drop and have an impact on their credit rating and, and, and indeed possibly their ABF facility and um, once PE are involved, depending on the level of debt that comes with the deal. Uh, and I've seen that with experience. Thank you. Uh, the next one, uh, there's a couple of parts to this. I'll pick the second part. Um, how does the panel think the PE market is going to be impacted with the slowing of the economy, um, short and long-term impact? And who wants that one? Has the PE market been uh, impacted? I, I think at the, at the moment, the PE, uh, they're, they're sitting on what has turned a lot of dry powder. There's a lot of money to be spent. Um, I, I, I think with the, the recent levels of restrictions and lockdowns, it's probably put a damper on some of that money being spent in, in this quarter. Um, but I'm fairly confident that um, that money has to be spent, as we talked about, what they need to do with their fund. And if it's not the back end of this quarter, certainly in the 2021, there's going to be opportunities abound. Um, opportunities from either companies that are on the distress side through 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 COVID, um, opportunities from entrepreneurs who may just have had enough and want an exit, or through the fact that they're seeing changes in capital gains tax coming through and also want to expedite an exit. Um, and then there's also going to be winners and losers through this COVID process. There's companies that are succeeding. And, and they're on an upward curve and, and equally so the time is right for them to sell as well. So you've got the whole spectrum of distressed companies and companies that are succeeding. In the middle of that, you've got private equity with an immense amount of money to be spent. So it, it, is that money going to be unleashed? Absolutely. When? Timing, but, but it will be. Thanks, Colin. Uh, que a question here uh, about um, remuneration uh, for FDs of PE-backed businesses, what would you see as a typical package um, in terms of 
uh, basic and, and equity stake. Who wants that one? So you should answer that one, Carl. Sorry? <laughs> you should answer that one. Yeah, exactly. Well, obviously a co combination uh, of, of both. Um, and we, we tend, I mean, it's all, all bespoke uh, and it depends on the, uh, the attractiveness of the deal and how confident uh, the, the, the individual is about um, wanting, you know, about the exit really and what they're going to get out of the exit and what that could mean in terms of wealth creation. So it comes down to the individual FD, uh, how much they, they need in terms of a basic and how much they can leave back, at, um, you know, leaving there as a, uh, as, 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 as sort of uh, incentives later on. Um, so there isn't a, a right or wrong answer, but um, Andy who asked that, if you wanted to speak to me individually about um, a specific scenario, well then uh, just reach out. Um, that pretty much is it. There's a few more questions in there, but we are uh, up to time. So uh, um, apologies if we've not got through everybody's questions. If anyone does want to reach out to you individually, if they didn't get their questions asked, uh, LinkedIn, I think we said just before we went live, LinkedIn's the best format to, uh, to contact you guys on. Is that, that okay if people want to reach out independently? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's bringing us up to time. Um, we will send out some correspondence to everyone that's tuned in today. Um, we don't charge for any of these events. All we ask is that you will like and share um, and to, to heighten the awareness of, of our events. So if you put a comment uh, for those of you that are on LinkedIn, that'd be fantastic. Obviously, if any of you are recruiting, we've got uh, accountancy recruit and HR recruit within the uh, suite of brands that we've got. Be more than happy to uh, to hear from any of you guys uh, should you, you need us. But um, you know, a massive thank you to everybody. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in, and um, and, and and thanks to to the panelists. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to formally uh, bring the session to a close. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>